Good afternoon. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Carol Genshaft. I'm curator at large here at the Columbus Museum of Art, and it's so good to see all of you. Uh, before I introduce our speaker for today, just a couple announcements. One is that this is our regular Wednesdays at 2 program, and there's one next week about um, Christmas in Art with David Stark, the head of our curatorial department who just walked in the door. So uh, you might want to catch that same time, same place uh, next week. And also just wanted to point out that we do have two sculptures by Louise Nevelson on view at the moment. Um, one is in the Center for Creativity. It's called Tropical Tree. It's um, black aluminum, and it's from 1975. And then there's one in the Walter Wing with our permanent contemporary collection entitled Black Mirror, and that's an early piece on wood from 1957. So you might um, want to catch those. We have a number of other works by Nevelson. One is the Cathedral Night Wall, a very large piece that um, has been on view here um, for a long, long time and was part of our PACE exhibition that opened the new wing. So um, at any rate, hope you'll get to see those. And now it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce Lori Wilson. I think you're going to be fascinated by um, her story of Louise Nevelson. Um, Lori is a New York-based biographer and art historian and the author of Louise Nevelson, Light and Shadow, published by Thames and Hudson just in October of this year. So this is hot off the presses. This book draws on her longtime involvement with the artist, dating back to the 1970s, when she spent 15 hours interviewing Nevelson for her doctoral dissertation. She has written over a dozen chapters, articles, and essays on Nevelson for professional journals and publications, including essays for the 1980 Whitney Museum exhibit, um, for which she conducted additional interviews with the artist, and the catalog essay for an exhibition at the Phoenix Museum of Art. She is also the author of Alberto Giacometti, Myth, Magic, and the Man, published by Yale University in 2003. But here's what's amazing. Um, she earned her BA and PhD degrees in art history from Wellesley College and City University of New York, she is also a practicing New York City psychoanalyst and also clinical associate professor of psychiatry at New York University Medical Center, a faculty member of the Psychoanalytic Institute affiliated with New York University Medical Center, and she is professor emerita of art therapy at New York University, where she directed the graduate art therapy program for 23 years. And in addition, she's an artist herself. So she is truly a Renaissance woman, and it gives me great pleasure to present Lori Wilson to you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Well, first, thanks to Carol and Cheryl for inviting me to be here in Columbus to talk about Louise Nevelson, a topic I have been involved with since the mid-70s, and then I took a break and came back in 2007 to write this biography. Uh, I told my husband this was not gonna take very long, maybe six months, and he rolled his eyes and said, sure. 11, <laughs> 11 years later, well, it's done. Uh, so, let me start with what I think is interesting for all of us, if you think about grandparents, on the left you see Nevelson's father's family, the Berlioskis, and they were in Pereyaslav, which is a medium-sized town in the Ukraine on the Dnieper River, uh, similar to the town that they ended up in, and you can see that they're educated, assimilated, sort of upper middle class Jewish family, that was doing really well until things got bad in Russia. And they, again, like millions of uh, Jews in Russia, Poland, left and came to America. But on the right, you see uh, Louise's maternal grandparents. And they were a much more um, primitive, uh, simple, uh, unsophisticated family, and they lived not in a shtetl, but in a village 
also near the Dnieper River. And the father came and saw this beautiful young girl and said, I have to marry her. And so he did and took her off to uh, Pereyaslav where uh, Nevelson was born in the house next to the house that Sholem Alechem sister lived. And so when, shortly after Nevelson was born, she was Leia Berliowski at the time, uh, Sholem Alechem came and saw this new baby and said, this child is born for greatness. Now, that was something that the whole family held on to for years. It was one of those talismans that she could tell herself when life was not so easy. So as, as an analyst and an art historian, I think your own personal familial history has an effect. And what I see on the left in two works done in the same time period, terracottas, is an elegant, uh, sophisticated form of the cow, which I think comes from, in some way, the heritage of her father's family, which included some architects and artists who had worked for the czars and, and so on. On the right, a much more primitive work. This is actually in the um, Cleveland Museum, uh, which I think reflects much more what she knew of her mother's family. Now, she said, Louise, I could go to go down Broadway or I could go down Park Avenue. I wanted to do both. So in her work, she felt she was combining these two things. And that is what you'll see. If you look at any of her sculpture, there is this combination of some raw, archaic power and some elegant uh, composition. Oh, I was supposed to start with a backstory, which is, when I, <laughs> you, it will help you understand some of this. When I first went to uh, figure out whether I could work on Louise Nevelson, I went to Arnie Glimcher, in, who had Pace Gallery, and he said, fine, go down, meet with her, see if you click, and uh, we'll go from there. So I went down and I met with her, and we seemed to click enough. And she said to me at this first interview, now, dear, your job is, going to make it, is to make it clear to the world that after Picasso, I'm the most important 20th century artist. <laughs> Well, I was already in the therapy business at the <laughs> And I thought, I am in big trouble. Thank you very much. So I, I was convinced I was with one of the world's uh, biggest narcissists. That was until our recent election. Um, <laughs> But she continued to say things like, I, I would say, so what was your reaction to the way the critics or the audience responded to this work or that work? So I, I had this whole series of interviews. And she would say things like, I didn't care about anyone else's reaction. I only cared about my reaction. So throughout the time I was writing my dissertation, I thought, this woman is just too much. She's too self-involved. It's just, uh, she's a great artist, but something not right for me. But when I came back to work on her in 2007, I then was looking at a zillion interviews that she had done with other people, and I, I interviewed some more people who knew her in the 70s and 80s, and what I came to see was, as a woman artist in New York, in a man's art world, she had to be focused. She had to be convinced that she could move forward. She had to stay really focused on her work and what she was doing with it. She had lots of women friends who were artists, and some of them were good. I don't think as good as she was, but they were not so focused. So they had families, they had all kinds of other things going on. She knew what she wanted to do. She believed in art. Art was the only thing she cared about. Their myths about her caring about money or other things, that was not what was important. Art was what was important for her. So this is the family in Rockland, Maine. Her father came over uh, a few years before. Uh, the mother uh, came over with uh, Louise, her older brother, uh, Nate, and her next youngest sister, Anita. 
And uh, the, the only one who was born who was an American citizen was Lillian, the one in the lap. And you can see that Louise was tall and that the whole family looked good. And that was one of the things that the mother cared about hugely, that they would look good. So she had a sense of fashion. She would get clothes for herself or her daughters and save them and protect them and put them in tissue paper and insisted on looking their best. So they, the husband was very proud of this, his beautiful family and they walked down the main street of Rockland uh, every week and people would sort of point to her and say she's beautiful, but she wears rouge, uh, the mother. Um, so she was overdressed in a Yankee family. But that was something that in a sense so eventually fed into Louise's sense of herself. And here you see on the left, she's a tall, uh, sort of in interested in fashion in her way uh, as an adolescent. And on the right, she's the, uh, let's see if I can make this happen, this one. So she faced anti-Semitism in the, in the school, in the district. There were 30 Jewish families and everybody else was Protestant, Yankee, and some Catholics and some uh, Italians. So as part of the high school, captain of the high school team, she would not have been invited to parties that they had to invite her to because she was captain, but they wouldn't have invited her because she was Jewish. So she was a very attractive, very charismatic young girl, but suffered uh, very much from the anti-Semitism of the community. And she protected her younger sisters, which I, is part of why the family stayed very close together throughout their lives. So the sisters would come and help her with her family, the brother sent her money, all kinds of things went on, partly because she had been the leader of the young uh, Berlioski family. This shows you some work she did in high school. She was the favorite of the art teacher, Lena Cleveland, who wore a purple hat and a purple coat, and so she admired her for lots of reasons. But uh, you can see on the left that she's made a drawing. Again, these were uh, assignments, but it's already very clear that she was interested in furniture. And on the right, there's a, a composition that's pretty complex for a 15, 16-year-old girl. And you see the steps leading upstairs, and you see the the, um, the rug being cut off. It's, it's, it, Lena Cleveland had gone to Pratt and knew about post-impressionists and Degas and those kinds of things, which she taught to her favorite art student. And Louise was the, the top artist in this school from grade one through 12. And she would say, all my art teachers, they really thought I was terrific. She only had one art teacher. <laughs> I had to check records carefully too, because artists do exaggerate. I know that's not news. Uh, so he, she then proceeded to do exactly what she claimed she wasn't going to do. She wanted to go to Pratt and study art, but there was no way in 1920 that a nice Jewish girl from a good family would go to New York and live alone and study art. So she did what she said she wasn't going to do. She got married, and she married a millionaire, which got her out of Rockland, Maine, and into New York. And there you see on the left uh, Charles Nevelson, who was shorter, balder, older, and um, from a from a Latvian family, and very from a very sort of uh, autocratic uh, um, cultural family, and. They did not want Louise to do artwork. Although she said, that's what I want to do. She made a deal with her husband before they married. She wasn't going to have children. She was going to make art. But in that family, what was said was, or what she said about them is, you could enjoy Beethoven, but you couldn't be Beethoven. So you see her very attractive on the right. Uh, you can see why she would appeal to uh, uh, shorter, balding, older, uh, <laughs> millionaire. Uh, and it was a semi-arranged marriage. Be and th that's a complicated story. You have to read the book to find out about that. <laughs> so needless to say, within a year, she was pregnant and had her one child, Mike, uh, largely because she didn't know how sex worked. And uh, so, 
I mean, it was 1919, 1920, so this is a, a time that for her was uh, surprising. She did not like being a mother. She did not like being a wife. She did not like preparing dinner, although they had maids and cooks and various other things until he, he, he lost the money, as did most people in the, in the late 20s. Uh, she, she didn't want to do that. She wanted to have a, a life as an, a, in some kind of art. Anyway, here you see her dressed up fancy as Mrs. Nevelson, and an interesting photograph from 1929, which was the year before she left her husband, you can see how unhappy she was. And then the, her mother, who was this somewhat more, from a more primitive background, but was an advanced progressive, in those years, saw her and said, Louise, you clearly are unhappy. You don't have to stay in this marriage. By this time, Nevelson had gone to the Art Students League in New York and had discovered Hans Hoffmann, the famous German artist, wanted to go to Munich to study with him because he was a great teacher, knew Picasso and Matisse, and that was the, the, the hot stuff at that time. And her mother said, bring your son up here to Rockland I'll take care of him, here's the money, go to Europe. Now, think about that in 1920, uh, 30 rather. It's, it's amazing that her mother recognized that her daughter, who had been so perky and lively and kind of the, the head of the, the, the siblings, was, was uh, closed up and really unhappy. And she made it possible for Louise to leave her husband. This is uh, now in the mid-30s, Louise has joined the WPA. Forgive me for calling her Louise. I did not do that when I was interviewing her. It's, it's, okay, I could, I should, anyway, this is a, a painting uh, she did in the mid-30s, because at first she was a painter. She didn't know she was a sculptor until the WPA, when she took a workshop with Chaim Gross and almost instantly discovered that sculpture was the right thing for her. So from the time that she did that in the mid-30s on the WPA, the, the works progress, uh, some, yeah, it's the new deal for art, uh, which kept artists alive. She was a teacher. Uh, she wasn't a, a sculptor or a painter. It wasn't on that level, but it kept her alive, kept her going at a time when, as you know, it was very hard for everyone. But you can see that she's a colorist. And one of the things that her high school classmate said was, she was great with color. She could do fantastic things with color. So already as a child and adolescent, she was really good with color. And I, I say that to and emphasize that because, as you know, most of her work is in black or white with a little gold. So the color disappeared. We'll see that it comes back at the end, but uh, this is to show you a, a New York City scene. All right. Uh, the war has started, her husband's with, her husband is long gone to uh, Texas. Uh, he didn't have any money by the time they split up, and she wouldn't take alimony even if he had. Her son was in the Merchant Marine somewhere, didn't, she didn't know where. She decided, I want to show with a serious gallerist. Now, during the WPA, she had shown with many other WPA artists, and she'd won some prizes. She was well-received. Her work was really well-received from from her earliest days as an artist, which is really the 30s. But she wanted to go beyond that. So she went into Karl Nierendorf's gallery, and he is the uh, German gallerist who moved to New York and put Paul Klee on the map, because he knew Klee and he represented Paul Klee. And he, uh, I mean, he saw this gorgeous woman. There she is in her 40s. She came, she sat down on his desk, she crossed her legs and said, I want to have a show. And, <laughs> and he said, well, I'd like to see your work. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he went down to see her work and he really liked it. And he gave her a show within like six weeks. So she had to take her WPA work and uh, paint it, upgrade it, get it ready for this show. So this, this was her second show at Nierendorf. Uh, there aren't photographs from the first one. But she was already, in, in 41, 42, was getting very good reviews in the New York Times, in the, the various New York papers, because something uh, was evident to people that she was a good artist. 
Now, the mid-40s in New York was the time of surrealism, that the surrealists, the European surrealists came over to New York to survive, and it was all the rage. So every American New York artist knew about them and was inspired by them, and these are works she did for a different gallery. The uh, gallery was run by Max Ernst's son, Jimmy Ernst, who loved her work, and that the, uh, the ferocious bull up on top, the tail moves, and these other things, I mean, just as examples of what she could do with wood, uh, and how playful and uh, a comedic sense that she had very early on. Now, it was also an environmental show, which uh, you wouldn't know unless you knew that she covered the floor of the gallery with sand and marbles, so that when you were in there, you were kind of in there. And that was because that's how she saw things. Oh, I left out a story you need to know. Um, the, remember the, the uh, landscape of the living room, where the f pieces of furniture in different places? All the children had a task, and her task was to clean up and make sure everything was in order. So what she liked to do was move the furniture around until it was exactly the way she wanted it. And she did that, not just uh, all the time growing up, but when she moved to New York and she would come back uh, in the summer to Rockland, Maine, she would move the furniture around in every room of the house, which is sort of astonishing that her somewhat depressed mother let her do that. She also, on her way to school, would look in the windows of neighbors and imagine moving the furniture around. <laughs> now, some of you probably are of the types to move your furniture around. Um, I had an aunt who was like that, but the, the main thing, finally dawned on me, years after I heard this story from her sisters, was that she had been practicing composition by doing that. By This goes here, that goes there, no, a little more this way, a little more that way. That was, that was her training, decades long training before she became an artist. So here is, I think, a quite good example of a show that she did after that, the, the Surrealist show, where she's taking used pieces of furniture and she's putting them together in just the right way. And you get a powerful sense of this woman who could compose in space. So there, things are off angle. She's taken just ordinary things and put them together in a way that, that has a power, a compositional power that's pretty amazing. So that you see the, the this circle is repeated by this, but it's not in a boring way. It's not symmetrical, it's just, it's somehow uh, set up in a way that, that keeps your, your mind alive. Okay, so after the marriage broke up, she broke up the marriage, she had boyfriends. There were two major boyfriends. This was the second. Uh, nobody knows what his last name is, but <laughs> she, <laughs> And I've, I've talked to lots of people. Uh, she, she met him on a freighter coming back from Guatemala, and, uh, and he moved in and was uh, sort of a steady person in the house. He would do things, uh, build things, move things, do whatever she needed him to do. And that was fine with her. She did not ever want to be married again or hooked up with someone who was more sophisticated, who came from a higher social level. She wanted to be with someone where she was not ruled, because by this time she had discovered freedom was where it was at. And she had discovered that the sense of self, and I'm now talking about Krishnamurti's sense of self, which is not selfish, it's knowing who you are and making decisions about your life and what you're going to do with it based not on what your parents have told you or what your cousins have told you or what, what's out there in the society, but what you feel is important to do. So she had learned about that kind of selfhood in the 20s and then lived it for the rest of her life. So she picked the men she wanted to be with and there was quite a variety and I actually interviewed some of them, not Johnny because he was long gone, and they told me how charismatic and extraordinary she was and how full of life. And they also said, but she wanted me to write poetry. And this was, this was for someone who had, had come from Vienna in the tough years. 
and uh, was selling uh, underwear on the street, and she said, but he, you've got to write poetry. Everybody had to be creative. She believed in that, and that's what it was supposed to be. So she got her sisters, who were not so talented, to make paintings, and so on. Okay, this, I think, shows you a sense of the giftedness of her compositional ability. It's the same element. Obviously, both works can't exist at the same time, but in one, the, base, the baseball bat is the mast of a ship. In the other, it's part of a game that looks like it could be a moving game. And it's very effective to do such a thing and shows the, the sort of taught compositional ability. Okay, here's a Jewish story. Uh, this piece is called First Personage. In other words, I, myself. This piece is called The Village. When I was interviewing her about this show, which is from 1957, same as the year of the, the piece that's upstairs, I said, so could you tell me about the work that's called The Village? And she said, no, dear, I never made a sculpture called The Village. So I showed her a photograph in an art magazine of the sculpture that has said The Village. And she said, no, dear, I'm sorry, I never made a sculpture called The Village. And then I showed her the checklist from the exhibition, and it said village. And she said, look, I'm sorry. I never made a sculpture called the village. And she denied it seven times. So I thought, as an analyst, something here is important. And what I finally <coughs> figured out or hypothesized is that after her father left, she and her two other siblings went to the mother's village. And they were there from uh, 1903 to 1905. There were a lot of pogroms right across the river, nearby. Some pogroms were so big and so frightful, they were even listed in the New York Times. There's no way that this three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old didn't know about how dangerous it was to be Jewish in a small village. So I'm guessing that this brought up uh, recollections of that. I mean, there are other things about this show, which are in the book that I'm not going into, that sh connect the first personage with the village, and that um, her denial of the importance of this piece is, I think, a giveaway. It's, it, I mean, when someone comes to you in your office and says, I had a perfectly happy childhood, really perfectly happy, and then you listen and you find out it was miserable, the denial tells you that it's something important. So that's my, my, my piece of, uh, of um, research. So this was the breakthrough show called Moon Garden Plus One. And this, in this show, she covered the windows, she covered the walls, the whole place was covered with her sculpture. She had developed this making of walls after that last show, and where each wall was a composition. And she wanted this to be in complete darkness so that you had the experience of the environment. But the owner of the gallery said that that's a liability, we cannot do that. His secretary had a blue scarf, he threw the blue scarf over the uh, the lamp of the secretary, and then there was this eerie blue light, which she loved. And that then became the way all of her environmental shows that were black uh, were, were shown in a kind of like, mysterious blue, blue light. So it started with this, but this was a, break, a breakthrough. Nobody in New York had done anything like this. No one had seen this kind of environmental work until she did this, and it, uh, it led to the Museum of Modern Art buying this piece or uh, obtaining this piece, which came from that show. And it also led to her having a weird reputation. So the Life magazine photograph on the left shows you sort of a greenish light and a funny hat. And they're, what they're saying is this mysterious woman, mysterious show has to be a little bit like a lunatic in order to 
uh, to do that. And on the right, you see what she actually looked like at the same time. But it led to a, a sense of her as having some capacity for, for mystery, which is something Eva Glimcher recognized. And whenever there were shows in Columbus, uh, whoever wrote the press release or whoever wrote the, the, um, the, cri the criticism referred to this sense of mystery and sense of magic that would come across in these works. So she had been with uh, Colette Roberts, who was the previous dealer, and she wanted to go the next step up to a, a commercial gallery. So she went to Martha Jackson Gallery, and Martha Jackson gave her a stipend of $20,000, which for 1960 was huge, and she started doing work in gold. Again, it's a complicated story. What did gold mean for her? Was it gelt? Was it, was it all kinds of things? But uh, the critics didn't like it much, and I think that's a mistake because I think you can see on the right the, the beautiful composition. They're, they're these circular things, and they're, it's not simple. It's always more complex, and your eye starts to find this harmonious composition that's just off enough to keep your eye and your mind, your perception, really fascinated. And she would say, someone would say, but those are toilet seats, Louise. And she would say to Arnie Glimcher, ah, but they're the halo of the Madonna. So she had a way of, of uh, transforming things. Okay. After that show, she wanted to go. She was in the Venice Biennale, one of four Americans, and it was a big deal. And she wanted to go to the next level of gallery. So she went to the Sydney Janus Gallery. And they made a deal that was a disaster for her because she then owned a house that had a lien on it. And he kept her work and she kept the advance and couldn't give it back to her, him. And he gave her the only show he gave her on, that opened on New Year's Eve. So needless to say, not too many people came. She started drinking a lot. She had been drinking some, but she started drinking a lot and was a mess and really had kind of fallen off the... the the height that she had been on with these other shows and the Venice Biennale, and this is what she looked like. And then she went out to California and worked at the Tamarind Lithography Workshop and did a bunch of uh, uh, lithographs, which uh, made her feel like I could do something, even though she was still drinking a lot. And Arnie Glimcher had already met her and given her a show in Boston in 1961 when she was still with Martha Jackson. And he took her work from New York, from the show that I showed you before with the gold, up to Boston. And he sold more uh, of her work than Martha Jackson sold from the same show. He was a soup, is, I should say, a super salesman. And uh, he came out to California and he said, let's work together. And she had said to him at, in Venice, if you move your gallery to New York, I'll come and work with you. And he had, the, the following year, he was moving to New York and he wanted to have her for the opening show, but she was still tied up with Janice. So she and Arnie Glimcher became a combination that was unbeatable. So there's Arnie on the left. Uh, he's like 21, 22 or 23. Uh, and you see that this, I mean, extraordinarily young, also charismatic guy, uh, connected up with Louise Nevelson, who was the same age as his mother, and they just clicked as, as an artist dealer. Now, Arnie loves art, so it's not just about the personality, it's about her art. And he, 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 they made each other rich and famous, is how I put it, because he was really good at selling, and she was really good at making sculpture. Now, you see her now with these famous Eyelashes, right? Okay. In the early 60s, Arnie wanted her to look fancier than she did in that other thing that I showed you. And so he wanted to get her together with a, a, a designer. So Arnold Scazzi met with Louise and said, I know just the thing for you, a little black suit. And she said, no, 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 no. I want gorgeous fabrics. So he started designing things that were more or less designed by Louise, but he, uh, she called him a seamstress. Uh, you understand. Anyway, 
It was the early 60s. Everyone in New York was wearing f fake eyelashes. So Arnie's wife, Millie, came in with wearing some fake eyelashes. And Louise said, I want to try some. Can you bring me some? So Millie went to the drugstore and bought three pair so that she could try these different ones. She put all three on, and that was it. <laughs> and from then on, she wore three pair of eyelashes. She, she did not want to look like an old lady. She wanted to look like a charismatic, uh, attractive person. So the other person who came into her life at that time was Diana McCowan, who had just graduated uh, with a, a BFA from Yale and was an artist and knew how to be helpful. And so Diana stayed and worked with Louise for 24 years until she died. So she had, Louise had Arnie on one side who would give her anything she needed financially. If sometimes he had to borrow money from her to do it. And uh, Diana on the other side who would do anything she needed in terms of the physical work around the house, cooking, uh, driving, and so on. Now we get to Pace. Uh, some of you met or knew Eva Glimcher. I unfortunately did not. There's a poster on the left from one of the shows she did of Nevelson's work. She did eight shows, and Nevelson came every show and was at the opening and stayed with uh, Eva Glimcher. They, they were buddies. They were travel buddies, and they were just good friends. They were the same age exactly, different in some ways, but similar in other ways. They were both gutsy ladies. I called her brassy in one version of the book, and Arnie said, no, no, that, that, that I won't go. So I had to explain that in another way, because it wasn't that she was brassy. She was gutsy and tough, and I, I told the small group, she would, they went, Louise and uh, Eva went to Paris, and they went to a restaurant without a reservation, and Eva walked in and said, give us your best table. This is the most famous artist in America. And they gave her the best table. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, they went to Egypt together in 65. And there are two other pictures, um, courtesy of uh, Patty Glimcher, who helped me find these photographs. But you can see their connectedness. And here are two pictures of Arnie and Louise, one from the 70s, one from toward the end of her life. And you can see their connectedness. They just, they just hit it off in every way. Supposedly, they both had been shy people. I've got to move faster here. Uh, and then they became good at presentation. OK, this is your work, uh, which I wish were on exhibit, but it, it had been on exhibit. Whenever you spend time with the Nevelson work. Just stay there and look at it. And you will begin to see how the composition ties together, holds up. Your eye moves across. It picks up this on this a way of looking. And then it picks up another thing. And they're, they're very complex and very simple at the same time. And the dealers would, uh, critics would say, She's impossible. Every year there's a new show. It shows different kind of work, but it always looks like Louise Nevelson. OK, here's another astonishing example. Three works. One is at the Rockefeller's home in uh, Westchester. It's in metal on the left. And the, these other two are in plexiglass or lucite. They're exactly the same piece of sculpture. If you look at these designs, you'll see they're exactly the same. She could take three different things and make them the same by tipping it over on the side, by doing it in a different medium. She was a brilliant uh, artist who said, I'm dumb, I don't know anything, because she didn't feel like her book learning was what it should be, since it was her second or third language when she came to the States. OK, so now she has two reputations. I told you about the mystery one. On the left, you see she was big deal. New York Times Magazine cover story. She's in front of one of the white works that she's done that I think is now at the Whitney Museum, and really praising her work, her life, telling her, her juicy stories. And on the right, you see something that makes her look kind of oddball. So she has this reputation of someone who looks kind of weird and who uses her persona uh, to get attention. 
But the thing that I finally came to see was she used the persona to get people to look at her so that they would then look at her work. It was something, it was a combination of what she had learned from her mother about you should look good, and it was she didn't like looking like a boring old lady, and it was if you look at me, I'll get you to see my work, and then you will, you will admire and appreciate it. And it worked. And Richard Gray, who was a gallerist in Chicago, said, Louise had this whole persona thing, but nobody, no women artists has had to do it since then, because she broke through. She was the most famous woman artist of the 20th century who made it completely without the help of a man. No Diego Rivera, no Willem de Kooning, no Jackson Pollock. She did it completely on her own. Okay. Some of the look came from what she had seen in Maine growing up. The gypsies, which they are wearing this clunky jewelry, long skirts, bandanas, and it was part of the, the absorbing what was visible around her that she put together finally and made her own look, which you see on the left. Okay, I'm gonna go quickly through this. She started working in metal in the 70s because public sculpture was a, a big deal, and Arnie encouraged her to do it. She loved going up to the, the Lippincott workshop, and they, the workers there loved working with her. They said, we're like her hands. She's a great artist. We do whatever she tells us. So that there's something up there that's, you know, five tons heavy. She'd say, move it slightly to the left. Okay, <laughs> now move it down a little bit. She was totally hands-on. She didn't send in drawings and have them done. She would go there and spend time until it was done. So these are two works that are in New York. This is the uh, plaza that was named for Nevelson in uh, New York. And this is one piece, very large piece. And just to show you what it's like, if you're underneath it, you could see how powerful it is. She was an amazing sculptor. She worked in wood one week and then worked in metal the next week and then did etchings and then did lithography. She liked to jump around. Okay, quickly, this is the first religious piece she did uh, for the synagogue in Great Neck. And you can see what it's, the title of it. Uh, she never talked about her Jewish history or her feelings about the Holocaust. She wrote something when she did the homage to Six Million. She said, it's private, I don't want to talk about it. Then she did this, which is in Boston. It's an extraordinary piece, and there you see it in, in its first version before it was painted black. Uh, it's a gorgeous piece of sculpture, and it was in this, the, the grids that she was starting to make move in and out. So these the, the, it's a, it, it got her to the three-dimensional metal work. Before that, it had been mostly, the, the metal work had been in these grids. Okay, then she did this chapel, which you can see in New York on 54th and Lexington in St. Peter's Church. It's the only existing environment that was all, that is still intact of, of hers that has stayed intact. Uh, this is a work she did, uh, Mrs. N's Palace, she and Arnie worked with two carpenters for two weeks and put this whole thing together. It's at the Metropolitan Museum. If you have any pull, get them to put it on exhibit because it's not right now. I tried, but uh, maybe in time. Um, I have two minutes. So the one time that she did uh, uh, something for a performance was when she did this for the St. Louis Opera Company it was Orfeo and Eurydice. And you see she's wearing a, it's a beer can, what she's wearing. And she did the sets and the costumes. And she got along really well. Most of the people who were working there were young, 20s and 30s, and she's now 70, no, 80 something. Uh, figure she's born in 1900. That's what she told everybody, and then she decided that no, it was really a year earlier. Anyway, she wanted to give something back to the people who had, had supported her so, so she went out, got a bunch of beer cans, got a truck to run over them, painted them gold on one side and black on the other side, and put a string through them so that uh, they could all have a gift of a Nevelson from her for this thing. And, and the, 
the staff's response was to get construction paper, black construction paper, make eyelashes <laughs> that, they, that they all wore for opening night. So they were, the sense of humor and generosity was uh, a lifelong thing. Okay, now we get to the last works, and you see color has come back in the one on the upper left. She's not painting it black. It's, it's a collage that's put together. There's a whole series she did where the color has returned. And on the right, it's the last metal sculpture she made, and the arrow is pointing to where she knew that by then she was going to go. And on the bottom left, and I should have a much bigger slide, this thing goes out, and she did a series that were so astonishingly full of vitality. You still know it's Nevelson, but it's not like the Nevelsons that she had done before. And this is the cemetery that her father had set up when he got into a fight with the other 30 Jewish families and wanted to have his own cemetery and his own synagogue. And then they made peace and they all joined back to the same synagogue, but he kept the cemetery. And she wanted to be buried there, but her son wanted her to be buried near where he was in Ackworth, New Hampshire, which is where she finally rested. You can't always get what you want from your kids, right? Okay, that's the story. I'd be glad to answer, ah, oh, good. Questions, if anybody has, yes. Well, I was, I was going to write my dissertation on Odéon Redon, but I, the grant money disappeared, so I had to find a subject I could do in New York uh, and not leave the country. So she was available. I had been an artist in the 60s. I sort of had been on the scene, knew when she was developing. And as I said, I went down and met with her, and it clicked. And then because I was also interested in the biography side, I interviewed so many people, and then I had this tons of material on her, and she was fascinating, really fascinating, and her work, I think, is wonderful. When I worked on Giacometti in between the dissertation and this book, I thought he was the greatest. I'm now reasonably convinced that she's a better artist, which is, uh, I know, heretical, right, Carol? <laughs> but whatever, yes. With the gallery? Oh, in 1985, she signed some papers that gave Diana uh, some terracottas and the right to, to reproduce the terracottas in other material. Uh, after she died, her son Mike came with a truck and took everything out of the house and put it in the truck up to his barn in Connecticut and locked the door. So there was a big fight for Diana to get the works that Nevelson had given her back. And Nevelson felt guilty about having left her son when he was nine to go to Munich and at various times you know, being close and being far. So she left everything to her son, which meant that Diana without these papers would have gotten nothing. And there was a big battle between uh, Diana and, and Mike. And there was also a big battle between Mike and Arnie, because Arnie had become the better son, right? Arnie could give her a chinchilla coat, he could give her anything and everything, and Mike couldn't do that, so he felt displaced. And when he finally uh, sold his part of the estate, which was a huge amount, in 2003, he did not want to sell any of it to Arnie Glimcher, who had been major for her but he was forced to because one of the other dealers in Italy who wanted to buy them, uh, a third of it, said, you've got to sell to Arnie. So it, it got divided three ways between the Pace Gallery, the Marconi Gallery in Milan, and the Gmurinska Gallery in Zurich. I don't know if that answers. I, I, uh, Mike also thought Diana was just a worker, uh, so why should she get anything special? But, Everybody around Louise knew that Diana had kept her alive longer and had done a lot to, uh, to, to let her be who she was. What yes? Pardon? What became of Diana? She lives in Ellington, uh, upstate New York. 
She was just in London where I gave three talks and she was there and did a little talk back for some of them. She, she, between Diana and Arnie, I got incredible amounts of information and Diana had, had notebooks that Louise had written in, dreams that she had written down, and she gave me all that material. So she's been totally supportive of all, all of this. Someone in the back, yes. Uh, Martha Jackson was entirely in favor of Louise doing whatever she wanted to do and she supported her going to Sidney Janice. Martha Jackson had a lot of Louise's work, so she kept on selling it and promoting it, even though Louise had gone elsewhere. There was a, a sort of a tangled up time when they had to uh, decide who had what work and how much was uh, Glimpture that he'd had at Pace Boston, how much was Martha Jackson that she had in storage. And Louise was enormously prolific, so she made more pieces than you can imagine, which meant she was hard to manage as a gallerist. Uh, how do you decide if it's this box, that's, and, and you take a photograph, and then you sell that to someone, and someone goes down to the studio, and three of those boxes are now in a different wall, which she has sold to somebody else. So uh, Martha Jackson's son uh, had a problem with uh, Louise's being prolific, but Martha Jackson and Louise went on vacations together. They remained friends to the end of Martha Jackson's life. So that her going to uh, Sidney Janice was not so surprising. I don't know if that answers that. What was Nevelson's relationship to other prominent woman artists in the 60s and 70s? For example, Eva Hesse, Barbara Hepworth, uh, Louise Bourgeois, Lee Krasner, Colin Pluto. She was always supportive of anyone who made art. I, Eva Hesse was from a different generation, so I don't really know the connection. I know about uh, Louise Bourgeois and Louise Nevelson were quite friendly in the 40s and early 50s. And then Louise Nevelson was hugely successful and Bourgeois was not yet so successful. I went to interview Bourgeois a number of times and she said, look, everything of Louise Nevelson comes out of my work. And I said, <laughs> okay. I'm just writing a dissertation. Show me the photographs that are the evidence. Uh, if it's, you know, if, if I can see it, I'll write about it. And I went back three weeks in a row. There was no evidence. But uh, she, uh, so the relationship was complicated because Nevelson was famous and Bourgeois was not. And Bourgeois had a famous husband, Robert Goldwater, who was a really gifted art historian. So she had a, a different kind of life. Younger women artists or women artists her age, she helped out whenever she could. So she went, I mean, she had a, a one woman show in 1967 at the Whitney. She would have shows with other women artists and include them even though she was the famous one, she would try to help them uh, get what they could from being with her. I don't know if that answers that. Yes. I think that's probably true. Um, I never asked her for an autograph. I didn't even have a photograph taken with me and her, which I stupidly didn't do. But I don't think she was a, an autograph kind of person. She was interested in having people look at her work and like her work and own her work. And that was much more important than an autograph for her. Well, she, she was always cold. 
So uh, she, anything that would help her be warm. And she would tell stories about, in school, she was not very good at any subject, but in the art room, she felt warm. So when, uh, when she got a fur coat, it was the fur on the inside and paisley on the outside, because she wanted to be warm. 